we are recording. Okay, shall we start? Yes. Perfect. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we're joining here from Turkey, uh, but I am a PhD candidate in University of Edinburgh working on uh, political science uh, and intricacies of authoritarianism uh, and similar topics. However, as a second ha hat, I have been a research task group chair in NATO uh, Science and Technology Organization since 2015. I have been working on various wargaming projects. Most recently, I am chairing SS172 gamification of uh, multi-domain wargaming. Uh, today, I will be presenting a new concept that is kind of a cross-section between the PhD work I am doing uh, on experimental games and wargaming from the work I'm doing in NATO. Here I have Ada with me. Ada, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure, I can go ahead. Hi all, it's Ada here from University of Strasbourg's law faculty. Um, I have been managing the Women in Command project based here in Turkey, where we basically developed a war game for women and beginners. And I have also been involved in Berks SAS 172 Research Task Group on multi-domain war gaming. And I also have my exploratory team on Gen Z inclusion in NATO. And very happy to be here today. Okay, so uh, let's start. Uh, our first slide is about... Uh, what we're going to talk about today. I just skip the overview, that's fine. Okay, here we're here to talk about scientific experiments. Now, I put this slide because experimental games uh, or using experiments uh, through gaming or wargaming is a new concept, not for wargamers, because we have analytical wargames that uh, tries to measure stuff, but experimental games is a quite new concept in academics. Now, to avoid any confusion, we're talking about scientific experiments, proper scientific experiments. And the, today's topic is how can gaming and wargaming can be used in the scientific experiment context. Next slide, please. Now, uh, many people here might be aware of what games are and wargaming, but again, for the sake of clarity, we're talking about the classic concept of games. They're artificial conflicts defined by rules and have a quantiful outcome. And when I use gamification, I will be using the description given here is using game design elements in a non-game context. So these are the Key, t key terms that we'll be repeating, key three terms, scientific, uh, scientific experiments, games, and gamification. So, experimental games, what to do, what do we mean by them? As I said, the concept is using games for the sake of scientific experiments. What do we know now? How is the literature? Let's have a quick look. The first one is for studying the behaviors. Now, games can be used to create controlled environment, environments where uh, the players react with the game, uh, um, engage with the game, and react to different outcomes that the game creates, and this creates an opportunity to observe them. The second one is the well-known education and learning. Now, this is not necessarily directly related to experimental games, but this comes across a lot when talking about experimental games and you're doing a literature review because most of the current topics, when you look into, directly look into the search words, the keywords, experiment and games, you will be seeing experiments trying to explore the educational and learning value of games. Now there's a bit confusion here and this is, purely due to experimental games or using games in the experimental setting is not a common theme. So this is where the literature is kind of dominated, but this is definitely different than using games for experiments. Now, the third one is social and cultural research. This is not that different from studying player behavior, 
But these are the three key terms and uh, literatures we come across. Now we're kind of discussing a different thing. So let's move a bit away from the literature and focus on what we mean. Now, there is a experimental quality to games. Now, as in scientific experiments, games have controlled environments where you can manipulate variables and observe the outcomes. Now, this gives you a cognitive process, a decision-making, and then you have learned behaviors, you have behaviors reflecting in the game. So it's an environment and you can use this environment in an experimental setting. Now, anyone uh, familiar with experiments and games is probably having red lights going in their mind, which you're correct. And I will come to those problems in a bit, uh, but let's stay in the positive for now. Now, the second part is engagement. What, why games should be used in experimental setting is that games create engagement. It motivates people. It makes people stick longer pay more, more attention to things they're doing. And this is a running team in experiments where uh, experiment designers try to come up with new methods of having the subject be more engaged with the experiment. So games obviously is designed for a, a, a engagement. So there's a quality in games that can improve uh, an experiment. Again, all conceptual, we will dive deeper in a bit. Cognitive load. Now, there is literature that says increasing the cognitive load during an experiment creates more natural behavior. For example, uh, in an experiment, uh, the experiment uh, designers had the subjects memorize a seven digit number and then had the experiment applied into a control group where the control group didn't memorize. And they argued that the group that memorized the seven digit number, because they had a cognitive load, they, they, had, they didn't have the layer that stopped them from behaving, being aware that they were being measured or observed in an experimental setting. So they acted more natural. That was their argument. So increasing cognitive load gives you an access to a more natural, realistic behavior. And games, if the subject is focused on playing the game, that might be a cognitive load where they forget that they obviously not forget, but be less aware that they're in an experiment and behave more naturally. So there's this argument. And the final is immersion. Now, uh, there's a real old book written in the 30s, uh, Homo Ludens. It's about how gaming is an in internal part of humanity, where everything the society and civilization has is a form of gaming. The book argues that the love system where you wear uh, elaborate clothes, wigs, ceremonies is, is a form of game. So the, the book argues that gaming is such a natural habit to us that is just our part. So the immersion part of the gaming is that you automatically make the situation more realistic. So let's imagine a survey experiment where the uh, treatment of the experiment is given in form of text. It's not that realistic. It is asking you to imagine a, a make-believe situation, a scenario. However, when it is wrapped around the game, the argument is the suspension of disbelief that we have as humanity helps us immerse ourselves into that situation more and make it more believable to us. Again, goes for the argument that the games could be a way to make experiments more realistic, more natural. So these are the general qualities of games 
that uh, is a pro argument for experimental games. So let's try to put this into a concept. Let's discuss what we're talking about. The first one uh, in, the, in the experimental games is the game is the treatment. Now, what do we mean by this? Is the most commonly occurring thing in the literature at the moment, which is you take the game and measure the effect of the game on the subject. So for example, does wargaming increase uh, military leadership skills? The experiment is simple. One uh, group plays war games, other group takes uh, PowerPoint lessons, and then you measure uh, based on uh, whatever uh, expertise measurement you have, uh, and then discuss whether the game the war gaming makes you a better military leader. So in this case, the game is the treatment, and it's the most common one. The second one is the more elusive one, and it is the thing we're discussing at the moment, is that uh, the game itself is the full experiment. The measures, the treatments, the control groups, everything is in the game. So literally playing the game is taking on the experiment. The third method is the treatment is gamified. Now this, you don't play the game or there is no game, but the treatment you're trying to give is gamified. Uh, there is not a whole great deal examples for this, but one example, uh, currently election studies uh, is trying a new method where uh, social media is mimicked and the subject is free to roam around in a social media like environment, like simulation, and uh, the data tracks what they click, which videos do they watch, uh, and it is to understand how people are being affected by different campaign approaches. Do they go for the military elite, as not the military, so the political elite, or do they go to the uh, celebrity? Uh, and that treatment is gamified. Uh, you can argue that it's not great gamification, but as I said, there's not whole great deal examples. It's just a one simple example that I was able to find. Now the fourth method is uh, the measures uh, you're applying is the game. Now, uh, imagine that rather than giving your subjects a survey, the survey is hidden in the game. So that the decisions they make is part of the game. Imagine a local government game where your task uh, for building a, a local community and the policies you choose uh, are just like a survey question where you ask your uh, policy preferences, but rather than this, it is gamified. But the treatment, the experiment part is more serious. It is out of the game. Uh, it is not part of the game. So the treatment is given in a more serious manner. And all these methods are different solutions to the set of problems that is written right next there. Why is it hard to use games in an experimental setting? And this is the thing that I was saying moments ago that some of you might have red alerts in your mind going, wait, games are not that straightforward to be used in experimental settings, which you're right, because games like decision-making. So you, you need to have an abundance of decision-making to have a good game, which in experiments, not necessarily good. You want a straightforward, here's treatment, here's measures, and you don't want many options. It just creates uh, a hard data structure to measure. It's not controlled. Games also like feedback. So am I winning? Am I losing? What happened to me? In experimental settings, feedback is a problematic thing because it becomes a treatment in itself. If I tell you your decision is right or wrong, that's a problematic thing for an ex experiment. Then games like collaboration. 
experiments don't like collaborations. Not all experiments are usually you want to have the person controlled, isolated. Uh, and obviously I'm generalizing here, there's collaborative experiments out there, but it just makes designing a game and an experiment together harder. Oh, then the next thing is competitiveness, right? The games are in nature competitive events. In experiments, you shouldn't be, comp be competing against your other uh, subjects. It's, it's, it makes things harder. Freedom to fail is definitely part of games where in experiments, uh, when you, how can you design fail? How can you put that in? Social competition, again, goes with the competitive uh, problems. Randomness, add a die roll to any game, it makes a nice fun game. Add a die roll to experiment, it suddenly makes your life a, a lot harder to isolate the effect of treatment when mm, only the, the whole idea is controlling the randomness is the experiment. And obviously joy, you want your game to be fun, to have that immersion, have that all uh, cognitive uh, load aspects of it. The joy aspects is, is what makes game or gamification interesting. And then trying to put that into uh, experiments just makes the whole thing hard. Now, the concepts are here, the problems are there. Uh, and then uh, I, when I designed this slide for the first time a couple of months ago, I kind of gave up on experimental games and my supervisors were like, maybe you should focus on a different thing, but uh, there's silver lining in everything. There is some good examples that gives us hope for this idea. Now, let's start with the um, first concept, the most common one, game is the treatment. This experiment uh, focuses on creating a VR experience, virtual reality experience, uh, where a woman experiences a childhood marriage scenario. It lives, the uh, subject lives through the eyes of a young girl who is forced to marry in a village. And you're full, uh, you control the actions of this girl through uh, multiple choice and then uh, the whole thing is shot in a 360 camera in a real environment so you're free to look around feel to explore everywhere uh, the movement is limited uh, the, obviously the camera moves and you move with it um, and the control group were um, they were just given a video a short movie high production value effective uh, commercial-like short movie on the same subject. And the point of this experiment was, does the VR increase the effective uh, empathy? Does VR create more empathy? Uh, so this was the first one. The game, uh, and it, it, why do we call this game? you might be uh, having the question, is because you were able to choose the actions and there were various uh, scenario options. It was, uh, if I'm not incorrect, is called the telltale yeah. gaming. Uh, so that's why this VR experiment was constituted as a game. Um, and the whole experiment was designed around it. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, and for the method four, where the game is the measure and exper the, the treatment is more serious, was this experiment. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure to call it an experiment, so I prefer to call it as a gamified focus group study. This one used the game Democracy 3, if you're unfamiliar with Democracy 3, Democracy 3 is a nation simulator where you play uh, as a ruling uh, government of that nation. You are able to enact policies, assign budgets to policies, cancel policies, and you try to manage the nation and get reelected. So this gamified study had Turkey as its 
focus uh, nation and the treatment was two separate groups. So the treatment had nothing to do with the game. The first group was more conservative students and the second group was more liberal students. The both teams were completely free on how to play the game uh, in the terms of they were free to implement any and all policies to their heart's desire. Uh, they were limited to only the majority vote of the decision was implemented in every turn. For so, for example, uh, if they if they were deciding to increase the uh, fuel tax, that there had to be a majority uh, within the group to implement that. And the two groups, the conservative and liberal groups played separately. They had no connections with e each other. Uh, and the goal was they had six turns, which is roughly two years in the game, uh, to end up with the most, I'm uh, sorry, highest economical output. So their score was based on how good the economy was. And what we were measuring here is the two different groups' policy decisions. Now, both groups took a survey, and in the survey, the uh, their democracy value, their authoritarianism score, uh, their left-right uh, orientation, voting patterns was almost identical. Only difference were the level of uh, religious practice between each group. And all intents and purposes, the survey put these groups in a similar political uh, outview of the world. You know, they were unhappy with the current government. They were left-leaning. But when they started to play the game, next slide, please. Um, the results were so interesting because liberal groups were on an agenda to revert back what was happening in Turkey all these 10, 20 years. And the conservative group started with banning the alcohol. And then they end up implementing really high security measures. Uh, the police, they issued machine guns, the police gave all right wiretapping uh, uh, allowances to secret police. And on the hot wash, uh, on the debriefing, both student groups were amazed uh, at their actions. And they, they, they were like, how the hell did we end up here? So this was an interesting, and this was done as a small pilot study. So it, it, this doesn't carry a whole lot academic rigor, but it kind of kickstarted the idea uh, for us that suspended disbelief and immersion is an effect and there's a value in it that should be explored. Uh, next slide, slide, please. And this is something uh, we didn't do. This is something we found on the internet. And this is our main subject. This is the Holy Grail. This is wargaming. And it is a full on scientific experiment. Uh, randomization is rigorously controlled. Uh, it is like uh, there's no dice rolls, the cards are set. Only difference between the games the treatment for the scientific experiment is the amount of nuclear weapons that the nation possesses. And the experiment is aimed to measure uh, how um, offensive or at which points you rely on deterrence based on the number of nuclear weapons you have. So the threshold to use nuclear weapons is it related to the number of nuclear uh, weapons you have? Is a really interesting and a great way of scientific experiment and wargaming because the aim is 100% wargaming. You have cyber, you have um, classical military capabilities. Again, all of them are controlled 
nations have equal distribution, they have equal weapons, equal opportunity. Only difference is the number of nuclear weapons that is controlled. And uh, uh, if you're interested in a war game and experiment and ex experimental games, do check this game out. Uh, it is an important uh, milestone in war gaming and, and experiments. Uh, next slide, please. So what is next for us before we move into Q&A? Because I have been sp speaking nonstop in a uh, not so great accent. So <laughs> I, I believe you have many questions. We will move to Q&A. But um, we are currently, uh, we secured funding from University of Edinburgh to conduct three uh, events. First one is a diplomacy themed game workshop. Second one is a simulation workshop where we use uh, election themed games for Polsai students. And the final one is uh, experiment design where we aim to use Robinson Crusoe uh, Island survival game and Paleo uh, prehistory game for behavioral um, observations. Now, Robinson Crusoe, uh, and this is the reason we picked this is there is a game theory experiment called public goods, if you're aware. So the public goods experiment focuses on uh, the game theory of uh, equilibrium, how the public good is distributed. There is an um, academic paper that has already gamified uh, the public goods experiment using an island survival team. Uh, in their experiment, they use a video game and the subjects are survivors in an island and the public good is uh, the resource of wood, where if they collect enough wood, they build a boat and leave. But there's also gold in the island. And if you gather gold in the end of the game, whoever has the highest gold is the winner or if they all built the chip in and built the boat, they all are winners. So that's the public goods experiment. Um, so we argued, that our aim is to introduce the Robinson Crusoe game uh, to see uh, if we can add more gamification into that and does it have more value? Can we rep replicate it? That's the focus with the Robinson Crusoe experiment design. Next slide, please. And uh, if you don't have any questions for me, uh, hopefully you have uh, that I said something worthwhile and you have questions, but if you don't, here's a discussion point uh, that we might all have is for our diplomacy game workshop. Now the diplomacy game, if you're aware, is a quite old game uh, focusing on an 1800s European diplomacy. What is great about this game is there is no random randomization in it. It is all about discussions uh, and it is already building mechanics that because it's not randomized, it makes it a nice case for an experimental setting. Now, we, were, we haven't come up with the exact idea on what to experiment on with because uh, she is a law graduate and I am Paul Sai, so we are not great on IR, uh, so we have few options that has already been done. First one is how does military elites change the diplomatic process? Uh, and I'm kind of partial to this one, all because obviously I'm into war gaming and I have lots of military connections. <laughs> so this would be fun to do a, a civilian diplomat game versus a military elite game and to uh, observe the differences. Um, the second one is foreign aid. How does foreign aid change the conflict? This experiment is post-conflict reconstruction. That might be hard to capture in diplomacy, but obviously with Ukraine, we have lots of foreign military aid coming in and lots of sanctions. So that could be an interesting experimental case uh, to have a crack on. And international elections is how does the internal governments affect the uh, um, international relationships? Again, that is 
bit hard because in diplomacy, you don't have that uh, internal actions part. One question that I have been having problem with, uh, and it is not entirely clear how Signal also solved it. Uh, obviously in experiments, you have the real people for that real subjects uh, interacting with the real treatment, right? So when you create a model like uh, foreign relationships and then you bring around the military elites, the question is, is it the realistic environment to test such a thing as international relationships? Is that realistic enough? But then uh, the second argument is wargaming. Obviously, uh, we have wargaming rather than have going and actually having actual wars to train each other. So obviously there's a merit in, uh, so, but again, saying this and academically proving it is different. So these are the challenges ahead uh, for this research agenda of ours. Um, I think this concludes our presentation. Uh, and if that's okay with everyone, we can open the questions. Uh, Nick, do you uh, moderate this? How do we go about it? Yes, so I will, uh, I've got them here in the chat and I will read them off because we upload these to YouTube and we want them to be able to uh, see that because they can't see it on the video. Uh, but let me read out some of these questions we've got here. Uh, we've got Tim Smith who noted, um, he sees many references to video games. What about higher level strategy and ops and tactics? Do you use a computational tabletop manual? Because they all serve distinct functions. Uh, this is just kind of your general approach to gaming uh, as experiments. Yeah, so uh, this is purely coincidence in the sense that these are the easiest ones we were able to implement. Um, computational... Uh, though it is easier it uh, in the sense of implementing it, it is harder to modify if it's a full-on computational game that requires funding, that requires uh, software development. So it's kind of an easy way out to pick board games, uh, off-the-shelf board games, and modify the hell out of them. Uh, the, the, for example, for Democracy 3, uh, it is such an easily modifiable game that it allowed us to add Turkey in it, which isn't in the original game, or ban some of the sensitive topics uh, like abortion. And um, I think it was terrorism because ethics board didn't clear them. So we just canceled those policies uh, in all honesty because it's uh, such an um, infant stage uh, area. Uh, we kind of sometimes take the easy ro ro route out. Uh, Tim, I'm sorry uh, if that's um, not up to your standards, but yeah, there's so much we can do with two people. Uh, but if you have any follow-on questions, happy to answer. Oh, we, we do, we do it. They're starting to roll in here. Uh, we've got a question from David Redpath. Uh, do you think that immersion also stops players and teams making up crap that they could put in a survey? This is with reference to your survey comment earlier. Uh, they actually have to make a decision and live with the consequences. They can't claim in a survey, for example, that they would do X, but in the real game problem said they actually did Y. Uh... So they can't, they can't put in a survey responses that are contrary to their actual behavior. Yes. Yes. So um, let's see. Uh, there is the 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 problem with that is uh, it survey answers is good in the sense that they're limited, uh, and if you do the wrong thing when you're designing the game fight experiment, and they do something out of bounds. Uh, then you are in a lot of trouble. So this is an area we didn't explore whole greatly because we, again, limited their decisions into certain set of, so for example, Democracy 3, there is set number of policies. It is just, there's so many policies rather than, you know, just four or five or 10 answers. In that sense, immersion help for them to not get bored of lots of choice 
On the contrary, it allowed them to discuss it in greater land where the discussion was also gold mine. We were capturing lots of data from that. Um, so let me just quickly go over uh, da David's question to make sure I answered. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, one thing, I don't have the exact reference, but I might just pass it up to Nick and he can put it in the captions on the YouTube video. One thing that I encountered while doing research for this and our previous work was that, um, especially tying into the cognitive load part, once, um, when, when I put my hands up, I just got blurred. <laughs> once um, the players, in quote, um, have things to deal with, and they have the context around it, for example, like in Democracy 3, then they start making decisions that they actually think are useful rather than just seeing them on a paper and thinking, no, this is actually unethical. I would never do that. But once they are playing the game, they see that, okay, this needs to be done, which is something that we have seen in Democracy 3 when exactly. the so, became kind of vindictive. And they so let's say, let's say, let's say, let's put into the survey questions yeah banning alcohol yeah exactly it is such an extreme move that and this is obviously me claiming because i didn't test it uh, many people might say ah this is a bit extreme banning alcohol but then in the game when they banned alcohol their claim was um well we're not making a lot of money. It creates more crime because it is related to crime. This is going to help us a whole lot of deal down the road in the future. You know, anything else, all of them is necessary. Alcohol, you know, I don't drink it. You don't drink yeah. it. Let's cancel it, right? <laughs> and then down the road, obviously, the more left-leaning part, because the game engine works like that if you do lots of um, non-liberal actions, obviously liberals get angry. And then that's the point where the liberals got angry. Yeah. And when I say angry, they were like, oh, the liberals are unhappy uh, notification. And then when they saw that, and that's the breaking point in the game, they went, oh, shit. And suddenly went on the complete opposite of, let's give machine guns to the police. There's an uprising coming. <laughs> uh, and then that was really interesting in the debrief, they were saying, okay, we just created the country we are unhappy with. Yeah. How did we end up doing that? And that's completely impossible to capture in a survey. Now, again, this, is, this was a pilot study and academic rigor is obviously debatable, but this is a enough starting point to make a claim for immersion. Uh, so if that's okay, we can move to the next question. Um, we have a follow-up question here from well uh from david who asks uh, how are you thinking about player knowledge and bias it seems that this is a key element of your experimental games and may create large bias in the results do you test before playing so to speak that's that's a brilliant question david thank you very much uh now we did in, again in democracy 3 we asked if uh, they played the game yeah. uh, and we tried to control it as well. So we we tried to ensure that everyone had the same level of knowledge playing it. Uh, one solution to this that we have come up with, for example, like the one we're planning to do for diplomacy is modify the game in a way that it is not harder to learn. The point of the experiment is not about learning the game, but focusing on the decision. And to that end, the most of the time, 90% of the time, our getaway is introducing vignettes. So rather than teaching the full game and playing the full game, you take a snapshot of the game, uh, which allows you to control it immensely. And then it, and it limits the rules that they need to learn again, and it limits the time. And just say, here's a snapshot, here's the three moves you are allowed to do. Uh, here's all you need to know. And even if you know the game, it, it is the, the, because the point of, of the game, a uh, point of the experiment is not winning the game. That knowledge is, doesn't become whole greatly important. It's kind of everyone is on a leveling field. Again, it's a delicate balance, might work sometimes, might not work all the time, but it goes back to any and all experiment design. Uh, that's the time you want 
to spend on thinking on the design and ensure that the game balance, learnability, uh, and game knowledge is not deal breakers of the experiment. We have a follow up question that kind of is 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 along that lines uh, from Matt Zefferman. Uh, he notes that a lot of these strategy games and war games are very complicated. What are some ideas, um, including the ones that you just mentioned, for kind of streamlining that process for your uh, experiment participants? So uh, for us, uh, the Women in Command project, if you have the time, do check it out. It's a great project that Ada has been leading. It focuses on teaching young women um, introduce them into wargaming. And during that uh, phase, we had our challenge was, let's design a game, a war game, that is so easy to learn that uh, the it can be finished in a day, the whole learning and playing. Because in our previous uh, NATO work in SS129, uh, we had less than four hours to play with groups. Uh, because the military schedules, that's how it works. People don't have great times to focus on war games. So that's why you have one war game that the Department of Defense or your army branch plays all these years and you keep playing that one. You always have these nice new games on the uh, shelves and you have, you know, maybe four hours with three friends uh, over a year to test it and it doesn't become part of the organization. So that is a general challenge in war gaming. And our solution to that was tutorials. So we based um, the, if you're aware of the game, the Civilization. The Civilization game is a great video game for this example. Each game is in itself a tutorial. You always start with one decision. Then you there's two decisions. Then you, there's three decisions. So, so we try to implement that into the Woman in Command game that every. The first time, first thing you do when you start the game, the game tells you, don't worry about all these bits and bobs. Here's one decision, focus on that. Now, how do you implement that to your experimental war game? Unless you're doing a um, design from scratch, it's not that easy to implement the solution. To that end, we always suggest break the game into smaller chunks because your experiment most likely is not going to be about the full game. It's going to be about one aspect of one treatment. So find that treatment, for example, let's say nuclear weapons or um, international military aid. Find that specific event where it is happening in that game flow and isolate it. Put a box around it, take it out, and try to gamify only that box. Uh, if that box doesn't exist, then that game might not be the correct game. And if there's no box exists in no other game, then you might end up needing to design your own game. But that's the approach we kind of follow. Try to, uh, this game has the mechanics we're looking for. Is there that box we can take it out where it is simple? There's only one or two rules to learn. And it is still, does it still carry all the benefits of gaming? Immersion, joyfulness, competitiveness, while not breaking the experiment. This is all abstract, but anyone and anyone who knows war gaming are gaming. It's like making, it's like painting. How do I describe uh, creating a great work of piece of art, right? If I'm being frustrating, I do apologize, but you know, <laughs> game designers and board gamers are like this. Uh, so, question? so we have a, just a follow-up in this, uh, if, all from Matt who no, asks, uh, can you provide a link to the women in command effort so that we can, uh, we can share it here in the chat? A hundred percent other. And uh, then we have a question from Alan. Earlier in the talk, you mentioned that game feedback can become like a new treatment. Do you have any mm -hmm. advice on how to structure feedback to advance the game, but not create or reduce the likelihood of treatment conflation? Right. So if you're having feedback, then you're obviously doing something like um, a signal game. So the game is the experiment. Or in my case, 
Democracy 3, where there was feedback. One way to cheat, uh, and obviously not cheating because you're doing academic work, is that feedback is controlled. So you exactly know the set of feedbacks you have and the conditions that the, that feedback is uh, triggered. So the, for the player, because they don't know the full amount of feedback, any feedback they receive is going to be uh, feel like random or a natural uh, reaction of the game world to them. For for example, for Democracy 3, as I said, if you do conservative um, actions, policies, the liberals get angry. And that was controlled. We, we didn't do overboard. We didn't repeat it. It was just one uh, intervention. Uh, and this was to, if you are familiar with Turkish politics, this was to replicate the uh, left-leaning protests that happened uh, around 2009, 2010. So the, uh, the vignette was uh, a left group is making a protest uh, in the streets. And it was that that and, and nothing sort of that happened again. Uh, but it was em en enough for them because any treatment uh, for that matter is related to what you're experiencing. So that's what I would say. Uh, but don't think in the terms of a full on game kind of feedback. Uh, if you do that, that it just becomes too complicated, too cumbersome to count all the possibilities. So I would say control your feedback um, and make it part of the experiment. And if not, if it's not part of the experiment, make sure that the full game, full experience of the flow of the game is the experiment itself, like the signal one. So start to end is the experiment. Um, so yes, uh, if that's enough, we can move to the next question. I think that that's all the questions we have here so far. Um, I think we probably want to know, um, are there any other initiatives besides your diplomacy initiative that you're working on, kind of ideas you're noodling on with regards to how to implement you know, these types of games for experiments? Or is it just the, the nature that there's so much... Uh, you need to find a topic that overlaps with both of your research specialties that is kind of limiting what you can do there. Right. So um, there is a recent book uh, by Patrick Jagoda. Um, it's called a Gamification in the Age of Digital Video Games. I think uh, I, I will share the link for that as well. Uh, and that is... I would say the cornerstone book kind of introducing experimental games. Uh, there is lots of ongoing studies, especially in uh, game theory, where gamification, video games are being uh, used as part of formal scientific experiments. Uh, but obviously um, you either know them through your personal connections or conferences, or once they publish, uh, not, uh, there's, there isn't any I'm aware of in uh, Edinburgh University. Um, and uh, what was I going to say? Obviously, yes, the analytical wargaming in NATO, in US, uh, they're always looking at different ways of using war games. Uh, they, they don't obviously approach from scientific experiment, but in the end of the game, analytical war game in itself is a sort of experiment. So if kind of that initiative moves towards more academically, I think there will be a great leap between academics and military spheres in analytical war gaming. Uh, that, that kind of uh, academic rigor would greatly benefit uh, NATO and all military work. But as again, as far as I'm aware, there isn't any besides here and there, uh, single academics, uh, personal endeavor. Thank you. Uh, are you all going to be publishing uh, any of your work, or where can we where can we find some of the follow up here? Uh, I, I was going to say you, you you are sounding like my supervisors. <laughs> uh, this yes, is, I, we're, I, we're we're interested in hearing what you have <laughs> to say. So you know, this is the friendly yeah. version of that question. Right, 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 right. So. Um, 
I would say um, the Diplomacy 3.1 is pub published as part of my master thesis from Edinburgh University. It's, it is in the annex of my master thesis. Um, I'm not 100% sure about the uh, diplomacy and the follow-on, uh, if they're going to be published because they're in the infant stage. I'm looking for uh, academic partners uh, to further that because again, we are not IR, as I said. Uh, so 100%, that is something we're exploring at the moment. Uh, and Signal is, the Signal game is published to check it out. It's a really good paper. Uh, and there's lots of, I think there's videos on it on uh, internet as well. Uh, and Women in Command is, isn't an academic project, but it's a NGO project. Um, maybe others master thesis will be about. So Hopefully, if you pressure yeah. me, I will pressure her to do her masters. So let's all together <laughs> pressure Ada to her master thesis. <laughs> I, th I think you addressed all the questions. This is fascinating uh, what you all have got going on here. Um, we can go ahead and end the recording here.